Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're on our 100-city tour. Today, we are in, uh, well, Bellevue College we're broadcasting from. I'll be speaking at Seattle Town Hall tonight. Then we're moving on tomorrow to Mount Vernon on Sunday. We'll be in Eugene, Oregon, in the afternoon and in Portland, Oregon, in the evening. And then we're on to Minneapolis on Monday, Cambridge on Tuesday, back home in New York on Wednesday. Uh, we urge you folks to keep listening and watching Democracy Now! as we discuss the presidential election. Um, in February, Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump came under criticism for wavering on whether or not he wants the support of the former Ku Klux Klan leader, David Duke. He was speaking on CNN's State of the Union with Jake Tapper. Trump refused to disavow Duke's support or the support of other white supremacists. Well, just so you understand, I don't know anything about David Duke, okay? I don't know anything about what you're even talking about with uh, white supremacy or white supremacists. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know, did, did he endorse me or what's going on? Because, you know, I know nothing about David Duke. I know nothing about white supremacists. And so you're asking me a question that I'm supposed to be talking about people that I know nothing about. But the, I guess the question from the, from the Anti-Defamation League is, even if you don't know about their endorsement, there are these groups and individuals endorsing you. Would you just say, unequivocally, you condemn them and you don't want their support? Well, I have to look at the group. I mean, I don't know what group you're talking about. You wouldn't want me to condemn a group that I know nothing about. I'd have to look. If you would send me a list of the groups, I will do research on them. And certainly, I would disavow if I thought there was something wrong. The but you Ku may Klux have Klan? groups in there that are totally fine, and it would be very unfair. So give me a list of the groups, and I'll let you know. Okay. I mean, I'm just talking about David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan here, but... I don't know. Any, honestly, I don't know David Duke. I don't believe I've ever met him. That is Donald Trump being challenged by Jake Tapper on CNN, uh, whether he would unequivocally disavow support from uh, David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan. Our guests are the former mayor of Seattle, Mike McGinn, a Bernie Sanders supporter, who, though, if the nominee were Hillary Clinton, will support her. We're also joined by Shama Swant who is a socialist city council member here in Seattle. Um, she supports the Bernie or Bust campaign. So here you have the Republican frontrunner, the presumptive nominee, uh, Shama Swant, uh, who can't quite get himself to say he wouldn't accept the support of a Klan leader. This is absolutely horrifying, the idea that a right-wing, misogynist, racist, bigot, anti-immigrant, Islamophobic, multi-billionaire could gain any traction in the minds of regular people. And what I find about this remarkable is not only that it is stomach-turning, but it is also really terrifying in the potential it might hold not just for Trump ascending in any given way. I don't think he's going to win. I think, you know, statistically speaking, I think Clinton is likely to win. But what's scary about this, I think, is what most scary is the fact that any space for this kind of right-wing hateful agenda that is given in politics, in the political discussion and discourse, what it means is that there is a potential for building an ongoing base for right-wing ideology. And that's what scares me the most. In fact, history is a guide. If you look at what happened with the Tea Party ascending in 2010, the reason they made such gains is not because America is turning right-wing. The mass of America is not right-wing. The mass of America is actually well to the left of U.S. Congress and well to the left of the Clinton-dominated uh, Democratic establishment. What has happened, though, and that's what the Tea Party's, uh, uh, you know, ascendancy shows, is that people are angry at the establishment, angry at the bailouts of the bankers, the very bankers who almost completely destroyed the economy, and working people losing day after day. And people are looking for, a, you know, grasping for a way to fight back. And Bernie Sanders' campaign, the fact that tens of millions of people have rallied around his message for a political revolution, this is absolutely historic. Some of the speeches Bernie has made are probably the most radical on mainstream television since 
MLK gave his re Riverside speech, you know, uh, 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 many years ago, decades ago. And Speaking so, out, out against the war against in the Vietnam. Against the war, against the war in Vietnam. You know, the speech that really transformed politically and radicalized an entire generation at that time. We're seeing a similar phenomenon where an entire generation of working people, and young people especially, teenagers, who are getting politically are transformed and radicalized, and it's not just Bernie. Bernie is, you know, his 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 campaigns, real uh, the the echo he has received is a sign that we are at a historic moment. And that is why I would say that for people who are scared of Trump, and I am one of them, I think we have to think intelligently about this and supporting the very establishment that allowed space to be created for the right wing is like is like saying you're going to double double down on a strategy that has failed in the past i mean you know mike said uh, made a very good point he did support my campaign as a socialist but i was running as a socialist alternative candidate in 2013 and 2015 both campaigns that we won as a challenge in defiance of the democratic estab party establishment that controls this city look at what happened in the state of washington uh, all the super delegates in the state of Washington are doubling down behind Hillary. But what happened in, in the primaries? You know, every county in the state of Washington went to Bernie Sanders in huge numbers. So why are these super delegates going for Clinton? Th that's, that's, that really captures the character <laughs> of the Democratic Party establishment. The uh, bulk of the establishment, you look at the senators, the Congress members, <laughs> super delegates, all of whom are all on the side of Clinton, virtually all of them, virtually none of them, very few of them on the side of Bernie. That shows you that the <coughs> party, the Democratic Party, is out of touch with the base of tens of millions of people who are looking for a shift away from corporate well, politics. Well, Mike McGinn, you support Bernie Sanders, but you'll support Hillary Clinton if she gets the nomination. Does that concern you, this utter alienation? from the majority of people in your state um, who supported Bernie Sanders uh, in uh, the poll here, in the caucus here? It does, it, excuse me, it does concern me quite a bit. And that's one of the reasons I'm a, a supporter of Sanders. And I was really looking for a word that I could disagree with, with what Shama was saying, the alienation of regular voters and regular people from the Democratic Party is a huge problem. And this, this election has really exposed it. In fact, the amount of success that Sanders has is, is absolutely astounding. And it's only going to become more and more as the years progress, if you look at the demographics of who his supporters are. But again, that energy can be used in so many different places to elect local elected officials, to push for changes you know, in state houses as well, and to bring pressure to bear um, on Congress and a new president. And that's why uh, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier, which is that the, the presidential election isn't, isn't the game. It's just the scorecard. And this is a high watermark. And this is indeed an historic moment. I was, a, as a young man, I was uh, working in, for a U.S. congressman in the Reagan era. And this is, it really feels like it's changing. And I can also say, as an elected official, um, who was not uh, the darling of the Democratic establishment in, in the city of Seattle? You know, anybody who follows us knows that, because I was pushing really hard for change. I needed the people behind me to make change happen. Explain how you won. You beat an incumbent. I beat an incumbent. I raised questions about a, a mega project, a major boondoggle, which is supported by the chamber and, and all the powerful interests. Um, and, and I did beat an incumbent and win. Um, I did not get much support from Democratic elected leaders, but I got support from voters because of my platform. But in office, I needed that pressure from the public in order to go where I wanted to go and to accomplish the things I wanted to accomplish. So does Shama, and so will any elected official. So it's the movement that matters, ultimately, uh, more than the elected official. So I am 100 percent with Shama that this movement has to continue against inequality and, and racism and and our anti, the anti-immigrant uh, stuff that we're, we're seeing from, from Trump. Um, but I would say to Sanders supporters that the, the, the most movement here will be in ensuring we have a Democrat who might listen to us than having a Republican who we can be assured won't, but take that energy to the state and local elections, take it to the ballot, um, which has been seen great successes here in Seattle, which is the threat of the public voting directly. And I don't think this is the high-water mark. I don't think the Sanders campaign is the high-water mark. It's the sign of an advancing tide. 
and we're going to continue to see change into the future, changes that the Democratic Party will have to respond to or become irrelevant. Last month, ahead of the New York primary, I went to uh, uh, cover a Bernie Sanders rally in the South Bronx. Thousands turned out for it. And afterwards, um, I spoke to Rosaria Dawson, who had been one of those who introduced him, and I asked her about Sanders' path to victory. This is it. You know, I'm seeing a lot of people already going and starting to, you know, talk to their superdelegates and talk to these different people and going, hey, like, this is not okay. You know, this is what happened. What happened was Hillary lost in 2008 because of the, her Iraq war vote. And she lost because a lot of election politics that went on that pe left a really sour taste in people's mouths. And she lost because of the delegates. And so rather than go, let's take that out of the system, she just started to work for it and started to get them on her side. And she started before the primaries having over like 400 delegates I pledged to her. That is not okay. So that was Rosaria Dawson. And a few weeks ago, actress Susan Sarandon caused a bit of controversy when she appeared on MSNBC with Chris Hayes. And um, she talked about Donald Trump perhaps being a better option than Hillary Clinton, though she says she was misinterpreted. This is Chris Hayes uh, speaking with Susan Sarandon. Isn't the question always in an election about choices, right? I mean, I think a lot of people think to themselves, well, if it's Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, um, and I think Bernie Sanders probably would think I this. think Bernie would probably encourage people because he doesn't have any ego in this thing. But I think a lot of people are sorry. I just can't bring myself to, to do that. How about you, personally? I don't know. I'm going to see what happens. Really? Really. I, I cannot believe that as you're watching the rise, well, you know, Donald some Trump people feels Donald a, Trump will bring the revolution immediately. If he gets in, then things will really, you know. Oh, you're saying the, 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 the Leninist model of yeah, heighten the contradictions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some people feel that's, that. Don't you think that's dangerous? I think that what's going on now, if you think that it's pragmatic to shore up the status quo right now, then you're not in touch with the status quo. The status quo is not working. And I think it's dangerous to think that we can continue the way we are with a militarized police force, with privatized prisons, with the death penalty, with a low minimum wage, with threats to women's rights, and think that you can't do something huge to turn that around. That was Susan Sarandon, a major Bernie Sanders supporter, speaking on MSNBC. Um, uh, sh uh, talk about this whole approach, Shama. Well, first of all, I think we have to be very, very clear. It would actually be dangerous and completely toxic for Trump, someone like Trump, to be at the head of this country for us to have any vision of a just society, of a humane society. I think that is uh, the idea of having Trump in the White House is completely antagonistic to the idea of building anywhere towards a just society. But I think the problem here is this. The problem is that the base of support that Trump has succeeded in getting, that base is regular working people who are angry at corporate politics, who are angry at the trade deals, who are angry at the fact that they're facing joblessness and low-wage jobs and that the billionaires got built on it. It's an irony that another billionaire is the one who is trying to, you know, drive them towards the uh, uh, towards a right-wing ideology. But I think uh, what, what's, what's happening here is that, if you, again, as you look at the example of the Tea Party, is that the uh, the logical fallacy of merely presenting Clinton as the alternative to Trump, here's the logical fallacy. She, despite a reservoir of racism and, and real bigotry that Trump is, you know, latching on to, the vast majority of people who are supporting him are supporting him because they hate establishment politicians like Clinton. So it makes no logical sense for us to then turn around and say that the way to peel off all those working people who are supporting Trump is to present the very epitome of that establishment that they are so, so angry about. So you're saying both Trump and Bernie Sanders represent the anti-establishment? I think Trump not intentionally, not, I mean, in a very cynical way, yes, in the <coughs> sense that the vast majority of people who are drawn towards Sanders or towards Trump are people who are angry at the establishment. And really, what if we fear the fact that Trump is experiencing a rise, and I fear that as much as anyone else does, then what we need to do is provide a <coughs> left alternative to Trump. And what, Sanders is that alternative. What do you see as his path to the presidency, uh, Sanders? 
Well, right now, I think there is, uh, the media pundits are right about one thing, which is in, if you look at the numbers, in terms of getting the Democratic Party nomination, I don't think that is likely to happen. And so the question is, how do we move forward? I do agree with Michael that it is not just about this presidential election year. But then we have to think about what is the correct way to move our movement forward? Where do we take our movement from this moment that we are here, where Sanders is unlikely to win the presidential nomination? Does it make sense for us to simply say that, well, now we should all hunker down and support Clinton? What I am saying is that in order to build a real movement, first of all, we have to understand that there are no shortcuts. Just supporting one presidential candidate is not the answer. And I would go so far as to say that even if Bernie Sanders were, in some alternate reality, become the president this year, that would not be enough. We would have to actually build a real mass movement below. But the question is, what makes sense for this movement that we are trying to build in terms of where, what strategy we use for the presidential election? And that is where I'm deferring from people who are saying that if you're worried about Trump, support Clinton. So what I'm you? saying, if you're worried about Trump, let's build a left alternative. And the first step is for Bernie to run all the way, if as an independent, if necessary. And if he doesn't run? If he doesn't run, we have As an to, independent? We, we have to, we, yeah, I mean, this is not about money. Who would Bernie. you vote for? Uh, well, I will vote for if uh, I will vote for the most viable, most powerful left challenge to the Democratic like and Republican party, party establishments. And so, if that is Jill Stein from the Green Party, then that's who I will be supporting. But at this moment, my concern is: can we build a really powerful left challenge? And if there was any possibility of Sanders and Stein running together on a Green Party ticket, let me tell you something: that would be absolutely historic, and I would wholeheartedly support that. Mike McGinn. So my approach on primaries is always in the primary, you pick the candidate you love and you really want to advance. And in the general, you just have to pick between who you think you like better. And that's kind of the way the, way the process works. And then you have to take that energy and, and, and try to get that next person to win a primary and come out of it. You want to get the people you love into positions that they can win. And that takes a lot of work between elections. Again, I reflect back on the Gore-Bush race. And we were all skeptical. Many people were skeptical of Gore, that he was too tied to the establishment. And I remember back then, you know, how uncomfortable it was to defend him against an attack from the left from Nader, that he was too tied to the big money and the status quo way of doing things. But I look at the Iraq war, I look at the lack of progress on climate, I think Al Gore would have had some convictions that we could have benefited from as compared to Bush. And that would be my fear here. You know, uh, I believe Hillary Clinton has some convictions that we could benefit from, and I think Trump has some convictions that as, scare the hell out of us. As a Bernie Sanders supporter, what advice do you have for Hillary Clinton? I think she needs to listen to the fact that the that young people, um, and in particular, are just fed up and disgusted with a system that's leaving them with so few choices that lower class, you know, working class people are getting hammered. We have a looming climate crisis. It's time for some boldness. It's time to listen to the voices of the people that are really getting it hard right now. And listen to the kids who are going to have to grow up in this future we've created. Listen to them and change and, and, and go there. Go towards the future, not towards protecting what's been, but, but where we need to go. Bernie Sanders says he would support Hillary Clinton if she were the nominee. You disagree with your own candidate, Shama Swan. I disagree with Bernie on several things, uh, and we this is one of those seconds. things I disagree on. I mean, Mike mentioned the question of climate change and convictions to fight big oil, but where is the conviction in the, on the part of Hillary Clinton? She has defended the fracking industry over and over again, and she has doubled down on that. So if we are really looking to fight climate change, we need a strategy to break away from big oil. That is why we need to start building an independent party for the 99%. So I would urge everybody to go to movementforbernie.org, where I have my petition the urging Sanders to run as an independent. And if he does not, then we have to continue building our movement for independence from the Democratic Party establishment and from the Republican Party. We're going to have to leave it there. And I want to thank you both for being with us. Mike McGinn, former mayor of Seattle, and Shama Sawant, the socialist Seattle city council member. We are broadcasting from Seattle, Washington.